This morning we are starting a new series, and I'll, uh, I'll introduce it a little bit more in the, in the message, but the first passage that we're going to be looking at in this series comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, verses 4 through 10 in the second chapter. Listen to the Word of God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Lord, guide us as we stand before Your Word, submit ourselves to it, seek it to work in our lives, consider it. And and Lord, trust you in it. Guide us as, guide my words, guide all of our hearts and minds as we seek you in your word now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. There is a, a, a theme in scripture that is very apt for the life of the faithful follower of Jesus Christ in today's world. It is the theme of the exile, of the the alien, of the of the stranger. That we are that we are aliens in a land that is not our home. That we are strangers to a to a culture that is not our own. That as Christians we are exiles in a world that doesn't share our worldview, does not reflect our values, and and does not support our faith in God. It is very analogous to when the Israelites lived in the land of Egypt or when they were taken out of the promised land and put in exile in, in Babylon or lived under the rule of Rome or even in apocalyptic terms, lived in the tribulation or will live in the tribulation. In those times, the Israelites were surrounded by people who had other gods, other values, other other things they relied on, found strength in and joy and hope and identity in, other things that gave them life that they lived for. And it challenged, it always challenged the Israelites' faith and and even sometimes mocked them for their beliefs. Here's the thing. When they lived in an environment that was such a challenge to their faith, their faith had to be strong. It had to be solid, it had to be secure, it had to be sure to survive. There aren't nominal Jews in Babylon the way that there aren't shallow Christians in in lands where Christians are persecuted for their faith, in in the Muslim world or in in China. And as the world changes and and faith, a Christian faith becomes less comfortable, less assumed, less valued, and more and more challenged by our culture, faith is going to need to become more and more resilient. Resilient. This is, this is particularly true for younger generations who are challenged by what one author has come to call the challenge of living in exile in digital Babylon. 
This challenge has been true for Christians in this, for all Christians in this age of the not yet, but the context of the now is proving even more and more challenging. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a short series that, that recognizes the challenges of faith in this age and identifies the key ingredients of a resilient faith in our age. The this, this series is guided and informed by a book, a recent book that was recommended to me by my dear friend Dean Weaver, and it lays a, a clear foundation for what we need for a thriving faith in digital Babylon. The book is called Faith for Exiles, Five Ways for a New Generation to Follow Jesus in Digital Babylon. It's a, by a man named David Kinneman. Kinneman is a, a leader of the Barna Group, whose purpose it is to keep the measure of the pulse of our current culture. And he says this about the discipleship that we're called to today. He writes, We propose that the goal of discipleship today is to develop Jesus followers who are resiliently faithful in the face of cultural coercion and who live a vibrant life in the Spirit. He also says, in digital Babylon, faithful, resilient disciples are handcrafted one life at a time. And through significant research, the Barna Group, of the Barna Group, they identified five patterns and practices, five qualities of, of resilient disciples in digital Babylon. And we're going to focus on one of these practices and qualities each of the next six weeks with one week thrown in for, for something else just for us. These are the biblical qualities of discipleship. And, and as they, but they are particularly important in our culture as they were these qualities for believers in the first century, a time that had some of the very, very similar challenges that we face more and more today in our world. The first quality... And to my mind, the primary quality of a resilient disciple in, in exile in digital Babylon is very simply an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. An intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And this is where any real discipleship as a believer in Jesus begins and ends. It is being in love with God. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It, it's more than just assenting to the truth. That mere assent without the commitment of love is not going to stand in an age of exile. And it was, it was never what God was looking for. And this, this love is facilitated through Jesus coming to us and being the one we love, because we can see so clearly how he loved us and loves us still. I want to talk this morning about two ways that we can see and foster this intimate relationship with Jesus. The first is very simply through understanding our identity, who we are. Identity. Part of the age of secularism, this, this age of authenticity, is the belief that we decide who we are. The belief in the world today is that we are who we want to be. Biblically, our identity is the culmination, the, the, the product of our desires and loves. There's a recent wonderful book by the, the philosopher from Calvin College named James K.A. Smith. I recommend it to you. And the, and the title says it all. You are what you love. You are what you love. And when our love is not first God, then we decide who we want to be. And that's, that's what the world proposes. There's a term for this self-identification running around these days, a funny term called branding. 
Branding, we brand ourselves, we identify ourselves. Ironically, today, this day of the year, is the most single important day of the year for branding. It's kind of the holiday of branding today. Can you guess why? It's Super Bowl Sunday. And there's one thing that is more important today than a football game. The one thing that is more important and gets more attention from more people than the game is the commercials. And today is the day that companies have more influence than any other single day or single moment to brand themselves on your heart. Here's the myth. The myth of our culture is that we create our own brand, our own identity. You hear it all the time. You can be anything you want to be. Just just choose who you want to be. And in this digital age, we can connect online with any of the things that we can brand ourselves with. And it's, it's like choosing from a menu. And everyone's trying to put their brand out first so that you would choose them. We identify ourselves with a combination of brands, bands and music, clothes and fashion, celebrities we admire, sports we follow or we play, where we're from, where we'd love to go, our work, our politics, our sexuality. We can brand ourselves with anything. Personally, I've always enjoyed the tools of writing, pens, ink, and paper. And when I could first start looking around online, I found there's a whole world of people interested in these things. And I discovered one group of them that met regularly, and people came from hours away to meet monthly at a, at a Panera's Bread in Baker Square in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it was about a 10-minute walk or two-minute drive from where I lived. And so I checked it out, and I became part of the group. And I found out there's a world of people for whom pens and stationery is their whole identity. They are pen people. I became a little bit of one, too. And there are, there are sub-brands within the group. There are, Jap there are people who like Japanese pens, and there are vintage pens aficionados, and there are Pelican fans or Parker Duofold fans. And, th and that's the nature of branding in digital Babylon. The, the menu of our self-branding has grown infinitely large. And so we choose from these things, and they give us our identity, and we try to make such a good mix of things that they would bring us enough purpose and meaning to satisfy those longings in our heart. One of those things may be choosing from and mixing into our own stew of identity could be our religion, our faith. And religion becomes just another branding of ourselves. And this is, not the, this is not the intimate faith that is part of resilient discipleship. When our religion is just part of our own self-identifying, something we throw into the branding stew, that's not a relationship. That's just branding. The identity of one who has an intimate faith in Jesus is very different than a self-branding experience. For the Christian, for the Christian, we don't give ourselves our own identity. Listen to Paul in this passage. God made us alive together in Christ. It is a gift, not a self-branding, not a work. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus, and He gives us purpose. God works through Him who loves us, and His love is the source of meaning, and in Him we have life. Our relationship with Jesus is not just another part of the stew of who we will ourselves to be. 
This is something so much better. This is something so much more. Our identity at its foundation is given to us as a creation of God and the object of his loving redemption. He comes to us. You can see how this is a, a countercultural understanding of life. And it's what makes us who we are. Brands don't ask much of us. And honestly, they don't offer much either. Jesus asks everything and gives us life as heirs of the kingdom of heaven. This is the nature of our loving relationship with Jesus. He is at the heart of who we are, our identity, for he is our greatest love. There's another aspect of an intimate relationship other than just our identity, uh, and it, that characterizes a resilient disciple, and that is the belief, the expectation that God really does speak, that God he speaks, that, is, that this is a relationship. And as in any relationship, we, we develop the practice of listening. Kinnaman writes, one of the keys to developing resilient faith and experiencing Jesus is growing young people's belief that a, that re, a real God really speaks to us that he has something unique to say to our hearts and destinies. In the Bible, through the Bible, and today, people hear from God. We may not hear as clearly as Moses did at the burning bush or on Mount Sinai, but with that belief that God has spoken and does speak to us, discipleship is the ongoing process of, of tuning our hearts to hear the voice of God speaking in our world and in our lives. God is alive and working, and, and we want to be a part of what He's doing and experience and love and live in the intimacy of relationship in which we not only pour out our hearts to God, but actively, attentively, discerningly, carefully, thoughtfully, sensitively, and openly, and lovingly listen and expect to hear his voice and see his leading and his love for us. For we are his workmanship, created for good works in Christ. He's still working, leading, speaking. Communication is, the, is a key to any relationship, and particularly to an intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Identity and communication are, are two key parts of resilient faith today and an intimate relationship with God. Now, life is hard. And, and faith is not getting any easier in our world, particularly for younger generations presented with many appealing and persuasive and well-marketed alternatives. We need a resilient faith. It, it's a matter of discipleship, of, of following Jesus, and that begins with ourselves experiencing an, an intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ, His Son, and offering it and helping others have that relationship as well. We, let's start by measuring our own commitments, our own loves, our own relationship with God. What is your identity? What is it? Is it in our own branding of ourselves? I have to say, this, this self-branding world is putting so much pressure on us, especially young people. And, and people find out it doesn't lead to the fulfillment that we need. No matter how successful we are in it, isolation, loneliness, depression, anxiety, they are a rampant result of this false myth in our world that this stuff 
is going to be enough, including and also the destruction of churches that have focus on religious branding rather than pointing people to Jesus and a relationship with Him. So, is our identity in the branding of ourselves, or has God chosen us through His love, building in us a love for Him? Where is your identity? Also, conversation. Do you seek, actively seek God's leading? Listen for His voice and see God working. We have to pursue opportunities to, to foster and exercise the communication part of our relationship with God. We're still early in the new year. There's, there's time to add some resolutions here. And the other parts of the resilient faith of this, of this stuff that we're going to be talking more in depth is going to go more in depth in, in some of these practices. But here's a short list. Scr- reading Scripture. Reading Scripture. Before you before you listen to others talk about Scripture, particularly online and especially in any niche media today, read it for yourselves. Be in it every day with, with prayer and supplication. Become very familiar with this book. And that, that leads also to study. Come to know the Word of God and, and, and be familiar with what God has said and done so that we can better discern now what he is saying and doing. That also leads to prayer. Prayer is not just lists for God so often of our our own branded desires. It is a pouring out of our longing that echoes his will working in our hearts and lives, our real love for others and for him and his glory. Hallowed be thy name. And as we grow in maturity, prayer becomes more and more listening and conversation. And finally, we'll we'll get we'll talk more about this, but but we gotta be talking with each other as well. Not, Not not merely be consumers of religious products, but be in relationship with other believers in a local church that you trust. I've, I've come to appreciate the leadership of this church. We met with the session on Thursday night, and I came to appreciate each other all the more. It doesn't mean that we agree on every issue, including some important things, but we all agree on the essentials. And I see their maturity of faith and their brokenness and confession of their mistakes and their losses. And their love, their love for Jesus. And their love for you in this body. And I see, I see the call of God on them to be leaders of this body. We need each other. We need each other. And we cannot grow a resilient faith alone or just online. We'll talk more about this in coming weeks. But to begin with, a resilient faith has at its core an intimate, passionate, deeply loving relationship with Jesus. I imagine many of you are going to be watching the Super Bowl this afternoon. Enjoy the commercials. (laughs) Recognize their persuasiveness. They're really good. Especially, check out two that are are themselves only going to point to Jesus. I, I think they might be special this afternoon. But while you watch this, or watch anything, or or hear anything in this world, know who you are and whose you are. There's a difference between calling oneself a Christian and being in an active relationship of love with Jesus. Knowing his strength when you're weak. 
hope in him when it's dark inside or out. Trust in Jesus when we're broken and afraid because we know Jesus. We've experienced his grace in the past. We trust his promises for tomorrow. And we believe, we believe in our heart right now, he's with us. Let's pray. Lord, life is hard and it's not getting any easier, especially the life of faith. And we do lift up ourselves and younger generations and coming generations for whom it's getting harder and harder. And God, we know it was hard in the first century just the way it is today when there's so many alternatives. But God, at its core, it's all about a relationship with you, knowing your salvation in Jesus Christ. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. It's your love that leads us to love you. And God, when we look at you, you become our first love because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, dying for our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins. God, may our, our whole identity begin with you not as a branding, but as a relationship. God, you are here, and you love us, and that's everything and enough. Guide us to grow in that love, to grow ever more in, in seeing your work, your leading, hearing your voice, not audibly, but knowing, knowing it's you, because we know your word, we know your will, we know your ways, and God, we come to know your voice. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for Paul <laughs> showing us, showing us who we are and praying for us to know that love in you. Thank you, Lord. We pray all this and submit ourselves to you in Jesus' name.